um, not that everyone know what to do, but we want to use our past experience to teach, to educate, to inspire, and to provide resources on how to access those resources. Stay tuned, we are coming back. Welcome to What Out Channel, a uh, YouTube that provides information to the community. We're always focusing to see expert people with information that can benefit refugees and migrants. As you all know, this is Emma, and I'm here with a wonderful expert in the community, very nice in advocacy. And uh, thank you very much for taking your time to join us on this show. Happy to be here. Thank you. This show is only focusing mostly on refugees and immigrants with those people in the community willing to support their community or to provide information to their community. I hope you will feel comfortable, my audience, knowing much about you, knowing what you do. Before we go ahead, can you please tell us more about who you are and what you do in the community of Sure. Chicago? sure. Thank you for having me on the show. Very excited to be here today. Yes. Um, so my name is Maria Haddon, and I'm alder person in the 49th Ward. So I'm the elected representative for Chicago City Council and the 49th Ward. I am originally from Columbus, Ohio, so I'm not too far away, and moved here after college. I have spent most of my professional life working in public service. Um, so I believe that we have to give back to the community, that when we work together, we are stronger and most of my life has been community organizing, um, working on issues around housing, working on issues around uh, access to voting, uh, and working on issues about access to our rights, especially when it comes to our municipal budgets. Um, so we should know how our tax dollars are being spent. I believe that communities should have more control over our funds. And so before running for office, that's what I did for work. Um, I lived here in Rogers Park. Um, since 2007. Um, I've lived in the same like one block area for like 14 years. Yeah. Um, uh, let's see. And then I first ran for office and won election in 2019. So this is my first term. So I'm three and a half years into my term. Yeah. Um, our terms are four years. And um, I'm up for re-election currently in the February election for the city of Chicago. This must be a busy time for elections. It is a busy time when for is elections. It, when is that happening? Um, so election day is Tuesday, February 28th. But we have early voting here as well in Chicago. And so you can do mail-in voting. Uh, mail-in ballots will be coming out at the beginning of February. We also have early voting in the wards. So you can vote anywhere, one of 50 locations. And that starts on February 13th. Wow. 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 Yeah, um, so I explained a little bit about my my channel, mm -hmm. you know, the audience refugees and the migrants. If you hear someone talking about a refugee, just a mention of the name a refugee or a migrant as a leader, what comes in your mind? Being that Rogers Park has been almost my exclusive home in Chicago, yeah. and that Rogers Park, Edgewater, Westridge, has such a history for decades and decades of being often the first home for a lot of refugees and immigrants. Um, I think of this community first. Um, <clears throat> like I said, I've been here since 2007, first moved here in 2004. And just in the short time that I've been here, there's been waves of people who've come to the country, right? And many, while Chicago might not be the very first place they start, this is a lot of times the first place people end up creating home and community. Um, we have um, a rich kind of mix of, of culture here because of so many people making Chicago and Rogers Park their first home. And so one of the things that first comes to mind is our neighborhood, yeah. um, our community. And it's one of the, um, the history and the kind of additions to community that our refugees and immigrants um, add to Chicago is one of the things actually that makes Chicago such a great city. Yeah, I would appreciate that myself being an immigrant or coming from the community of immigrants, I found Chicago as a home. as like a welcoming community mm -hmm. and I feel so safe and comfortable being in this environment. Thank you, that's so nice. Um, what plans do you have to involve 
people like us as refugees and migrants in the community. You know, there is a there's a big disconnection between refugees or migrants with uh, elected officials, mm -hmm. with the host community. How can we break through these barriers of disconnection? And I'll say, unfortunately, in my short time, some of the opportunities that I've had to connect um, have revolved around emergencies and right. negative things. So right in taking office, um, one of the things that marked the first summer, uh, like the summer of 2019, yeah. were so many of the attacks on immigrants from the federal government. So the threat of immigration raids, right? Because here in our community, um, all through Chicago, but in Rogers Park too, there are so many different levels of documentation that people have, right? Um, immigrants and refugees is a broad category with like a lot of different experiences. Yeah. And, um, you know, myself, we had a whole community group called Protect Rogers Park that was created to help alert community about potential ice raids. And so we did a lot of Know Your Rights canvassing, working with local organizations. Um, on the positive side, yeah. my experience in engaging has been with a lot of our nonprofit organizations. Yeah. So from where we met, um, right, in World Kind of Refugee Day, but also, you know, Central Romero, the HANA Center, the Indo-American Center, these are fantastic institutions that partner with my office and so many of the kind of city services or um, other state services um, and community needs um, are communicated to me right, yep. by them and vice versa. And so they're fantastic partners for outreach. One of the things that I would like to do better, and it's particularly challenging here, yes. is around language access, but also around helping people to feel like we have more access to elected officials because it is the nature sometimes of the experience yeah. that some people are here, especially folks maybe with refugee status, um, because of government <laughs> in a home country. And so people sometimes are hesitant to engage with government in my yeah. experience. Yeah. So I've tried to, and I will continue to work to make my office a friendly place where people know like it's a safe space. And I think that we maybe have more ability to do that at city government because um, we're not as powerful, we're not as threatening, um, and it's one of my aims in my term to make sure that everybody feels like they can come to the older person. Thanks. You talked about um, language access. I don't know how you're planning to do that, because as you all know, that most refugees and migrants have limited capacity of language. Mm -hmm and the national language here is English. Mm -hmm. So this language has been, you know, affecting the accessibility of services. Some employers, some uh, service providers, hospitals, they are reluctant about providing these services. What courage can we put in space so that people can have equal access of services when it comes to language? Some of it is culture changing, right? So uh, you mentioned uh, some institutions, like vital institutions that people need, yeah. they don't even think about it, right? And some of that is about how to change the culture. So in my office, um, particularly because, you know, in Rogers Park, I, we have like 80 languages, right? Yeah. Um, but we do still have a, a lot of primary ones. So we've started in my first term um, with being the first office to make everything at least bilingual. Yeah. So Spanish is another very prominent language um, in our area, in our city. So we do everything in English and Spanish um, in our written communications, um, interpretation for meetings and things of that sort. Um, this next term, I look to expand to include American Sign Language as well. And then as much as possible, especially when it's um, really key information. So for instance, at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, yeah. um, we reached out to additional partners in the community for more languages. So including French, including Arabic, right? Including Russian, these are other major languages in our area. Yeah. And so we do have resources, at least locally, where because we're a community of immigrants, right? There are people here who speak multiple languages. Um, do. Yeah. Currently in my office, I have staff. Um, we speak English, Spanish, um, Russian, and a little bit of Ukrainian. Oh. 
good. Speaking of Ukrainian and Afghanistan, the crisis has been so high. Is there anything government preparing for them, for their space, to welcome them in their community? At the city level, um, the things that we've done are the things that Chicago knows how to do. Yeah. And a lot of it has been um, helping to get more resources for our community organizations, much of which comes through the federal government. Yeah. And it's never enough. <laughs> but um, but then a lot of it is helping people acclimate through our schools. Mm -hmm. um, so Sullivan High School, Kilmer Elementary School, um, uh, oh, um, Newfield, Eugene Field, Gale, Jordan, um, almost all of our Rogers Park schools, because of the families who live here, mm. um, have staff that speak multiple languages, right? Have people working and living there that are more integrated. And so with that uh, latest kind of influx of Ukrainian and Afghani refugees, um, Albany Park is an area where more people are kind of being settled. But I'll say that they came to Rogers Park schools to talk to the administrators and the teachers and the staff here to learn about how like Sullivan High School in particular has created um, programming and education to help the kids kind of integrate and acclimate and to support the family. So, so much here through our schools works at working with the young people who then end up being such strong advocates and resources of information for their adult family members at home. So that means schools are prepared. Schools are and prepared. And they are supported by the government to be welcome families. Here in Chicago they in are. Chicago. Here in Chicago, Chicago they are. <laughs> okay. When when I when I look at your priorities of of housing, yes. right? You talked about housing. I think refugees and immigrants, this is a big issue. Yes. Uh, it can be to also other Americans too. Mm -hmm. But our biggest issue is credit. We come here with low credit completely, mm -hmm. and that limits us to access housing. Because even if you can afford, but you cannot get a permit mm -hmm. or a house, what is, is there any plan put in place? Or, you know, there's not a plan, but it's actually one of the. It, I was. Um, it was helpful to hear you share that with me. I know you kind of shared the information because it's honestly not something that I had thought about, yeah. right? So something that's not my experience so that I hadn't thought about. What I do see in my office though is a related experience for a lot of community members, um, not because they have no credit, but for some people who don't have good credit. Yeah. And the housing market is so tied to that. And so things that I'm thinking about as I move into a second term are on what are other reforms that the city of Chicago can do in order to alleviate this. Um, some of the complaints that I hear in my office over the last couple of years in particular involve the credit score. And it's a frequent experience, especially because people have such hard economic times yeah. over these last couple of years where I have the money, I can pay the rent, I have the job, right? Um, but my credit score is not good enough. And to complicate it, the apartment companies and the landlords, they take your application fee. Yeah. And it's expensive. It is. Right? $75, $100, you have to pay the application fee. And you even may know your credit score. Or I have people who say, I, I talk to the management company and I let them know, like, I don't have a good credit score, but I have the proof of income. I can pay. And people who tell, tell the management companies up front this, they still take their money for the application fee. And then they deny them. And then, of course, you're out of $100, $75. And that this happens time and time again. I've had um, neighbors who have had co-signers um, and still you know, are denied places. And it's becoming increasingly difficult for a lot of people in our community. So it is good to know. It's helpful information to me to know that this also is a particular impact on immigrants and refugees who are starting with no credit and establishment because yeah. it has to change. And right now, there are no regulations that the city of Chicago has or the state of Illinois has to regulate those fees and to regulate those practices. And it's becoming, it's, it's like an emergency. It's becoming increasingly difficult for people here to find housing because the, the rent is already very high. Yeah. And now the cost of finding housing makes it very challenging. And then the housing that people find, sometimes it's not good. Yeah. Um, the landlords don't take care of the property. 
And these are some of the top issues that we actually deal with in our office. Because here in our ward, the 49th ward, 75% um, of the people who live here are renters. I have similar experience for, you know, when I came here, I, we tried to look for apartment. Mm -hmm. We applied over 18 mm -hmm. apartments and we were paying that, that application fee, application fee yeah. and they just stick and they don't approve it for a long period of time until we got a co-signer. Mm -hmm. An American person who was able to help us secure the apartment, mm -hmm. and we could pay, but they could not give it to us. Yeah. It's so common. And also, other landlords that I've seen, because they know that this population have limited capacity, they have no much idea about housing policies, so they take advantage of them mm -hmm. uh, by not maintaining, as you said, maintaining their apartments or threatening them with evictions. Mm -hmm. I don't know how. What plans as a community could do to advocate or to to inform the landlords mm -hmm. to be aware that this population deserves respect and deserves to be treated as a normal as anyone else. I don't know how much luck we'd have in, in changing the landlord's mind, yeah. but I think that it's very possible to organize this community. So yeah. um, historically we have had lots of housing organizing experience, um, and I have personally as well, yeah. in this neighborhood and in Chicago. Um, first and foremost, people should know that this is a perfect thing they can call their alderman about, right? They can call their alderman's office as they the city. You. Yes, they can call me. If you don't live in the 49th Ward, you can find your older person. You can go to your older person's office or call them. So when people call me and they say, hey, my landlord isn't providing enough heat, or the water's been shut off for two days, or there's a dangerous repair that they won't fix, there's a hole in my wall, there's a leak here, and I, they have called, I've reported it, people send me pictures, and then what I can do, I follow up with the landlord, and if the landlord doesn't respond with me, we call the city's department of buildings. So it can be a little tricky because sometimes people are afraid to report yeah. because they don't want to lose their house I have. However, we can't live in fear, and if we don't know about it, we can't make them fix it. So the city does advocate for tenants. We will work on buildings issues. We will make landlords fix buildings issues, and if you make us aware of it, it's something we can help with. I think another key piece is people need to know their rights. Mm -hmm. um, so we have information on my website, and that's something else that we can help with um, and maybe partner with more organizations on is people need to know what their rights are. Um, we have a lot of rules that say, you know, how warm it has to be kept in your apartment, um, if there's air conditioning, how cool, and when it needs to be turned on, what types of accommodations, um, you know, if they have to give you back your security deposit. But tenants need to know their rights because especially people are taken advantage of when they're seen as vulnerable. Yeah. Um, people also, um, immigrants and refugees, but a lot of the neighbors who live here who are not, a lot of people are working so hard too. People have multiple jobs, they have families, and when you're busy and you have a lot of other responsibilities, um, sometimes you just don't have time, right, to follow up or to advocate for yourself. But in addition to my office, we also have free legal aid resources so that we can connect people with legal aid resources so that you have more people to help advocate for you. Thank you. So if you are out there and you are facing a challenge with any of whatever we have highlighted here, please feel free to contact uh, the office. You will get support you need. Uh, is there any available resources, uh, housing resources or housing assistance in Chicago community for folks struggling with rent or income evictions? Yes, um, but not enough. Okay. Not enough. So before the pandemic, um, there is a monthly fund that the city has for rental assistance. So let's say maybe you didn't make as much money at work this month or, you know, maybe you were sick, you know, um, and you just need a little bit of money to help you pay rent. Yes. You can call um, free one one or an alderman's office, my office, and we contact the city. And it's every month there's a certain amount of money It's for the whole city. You can apply, and if you're soon enough, you get it. Now, with the pandemic and the additional funds that we received from the federal government, we were able to do a lot more rental assistance for people, so millions of dollars 
in rental assistance. Um, even locally here in Rogers Park, um, my office coordinated the Rogers Park Community Response Team, and we worked with Northside Community Resources here in Rogers Park and collected donations and we were able to give people like $500 hardship payments, right? We had $60,000 that we raised. Um, so those funds are gone. Many of the rental assistance programs are also gone now too. So for housing advocacy, we help people find affordable housing. So you can call our office. We work closely with Northside Community Resources as well and some of our other community partners to help identify affordable housing for people. Um, but it's a struggle, like it is. So. On the city level, I advocate and have been the lead um, several policies to actually increase affordable housing. So to increase the minimum requirements when somebody's building a new building, yeah. that they have to have at least 20% of those units be affordable. It used to only be 10%, we made it 20%. Um, we also um, have tried to make more accessible housing for people, for people with disabilities, because that's another struggle where sometimes Maybe you find a place that you can afford, but maybe you have a disability or a senior relative, right? And now it's a place where there aren't enough elevator buildings. So working to build more of that housing and create more of it, especially in communities like ours, has been a priority. Thank you. Uh, speaking of, of, of resources, uh, there is this perception sometimes I'm RFG, and I can, I can express that uh, we often hear that uh, refugees and immigrants are here to take free, gov free government resources and uh, citizen jobs. And um, I think, I don't know, is that true? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's not true. And thankfully, I'll say, you know, it's different and you hear different opinions where you live, yeah. right? Yeah. And attitudes can be changed also by you know, who are the people in power? Yeah. What are the things they're telling people? So we're, we are living through a kind of a weird time, right? In the United States where our major political parties have big divides over this. There's been an increase in like anti-immigrant and anti-refugee sentiment um, in more parts of the country. Um, we live here where I think we've been largely sheltered from it, but still, right? There's still a little bit and as our federal government continues to not come up with good solutions for how to reform our immigration policies, for how to standardize things, the pressures that people feel um, can help create those fears, right? Yeah. When, when a lot of people might be living in poverty, which we are in the United States, right? Yeah. With a lot of people living in poverty, when there's a lot of economic uncertainty, and if government isn't coming up with solutions, people get afraid. And when people are afraid, they those fears creep up. And it doesn't matter if they're true or not, right? Yeah. And it's like nobody's taking anybody's jobs. Nobody's taking anybody's resources. Um, everybody's paying taxes. It's like people come here and they work and they're paying yeah, taxes, paying right? Taxes. Yeah, and sometimes you don't even get to benefit from the taxes that you're paying. You're right, yeah. Um, so that's just not true, right, on how it works. But when people are afraid, they'll believe lots of things because they don't have better answers. And that's where we need better leadership. Um, we need leadership in government and leadership at community level to help educate people, to inform them, and to help us kind of bring people together. Um, here in Rogers Park in the 49th Ward, overwhelmingly, because so many people are themselves immigrants or were refugees or descendants from, um, people are very open and welcoming and supportive and don't tend to hold those views. Yeah. And even here in this neighborhood, the latest, the latest wave, right, of um, think of the, the migrants being shipped, right, from Texas. The Texas governor who's just taking people, mm -hmm. putting them on buses, lying to them and shipping them to cities around the country. It's a very traumatic experience. It's created a lot of disruption in cities. So even a city like Chicago, who has a lot of money, and a lot of resources and is a welcoming city, we're struggling. We have emergency shelters that the city has opened up. And right now, um, we're fighting with the state to get more state funds because the city of Chicago, we got some money last year and they haven't given us money again this year. So like we have new waves of like new people arriving, seeking asylum. So specifically asylum seekers. Um, some people are being allowed in some people are not, right? Haitians are having a harder time getting in. Yeah. 
Um, and that's complicated, right? So there are all kinds of prejudices and different things that are inherent in our immigration policies that um, I'm learning a lot about because I'm just an alderman, right? I'm just an alderman. And it's not typically the type of thing that a city council person has to think about or consider. But um, as the world grows smaller, these are the types of things that impact us right here in our neighborhood. And so um, the last couple of months, I've actually had a lot of my work and the city's work involved in making sure that we are um, uh, receiving people and making sure they have health care, making sure they're connected, making sure they at least have temporary shelter and finding ways to connect them to services. And even in a community as well resourced as ours for services for like newly arriving people, immigrants and refugees, our organizations are strained and struggling. So we need more help right now from yeah. the federal government as well. We do. More special resettlement organizations. Yes. We really need support. Yes, because city council, we're not trained. We don't have experience, even with uh, all of our departments, we don't have experience with resettlement, right? Yeah. Um, we have organizational partners that do, but they need more staff. They need more funding, right? And we need that support. So we're advocating to our state and federal government for those dollars. So how can we help as refugees and immigrants? Call your state rep. Call your state senator. Right now, the state is the, the piece where we need them to advocate more. We need the governor to advocate more. Um, I know that the governor's administration, Governor Pritzker and his folks, have been very supportive yep. um, previously. So I believe they'll continue to. And they're powerful, so they can help us push for broader solutions. Um, Senator Durbin um, and Senator Duckworth. Um, Senator Durbin has been a great friend and ally and supporter. Um, Congresswoman Schakowsky. So... Um, whether you're, uh, whatever your documentation status, whether you're a citizen and able to vote or not, as elected officials, constituents who live in our districts are people who we are supposed to answer to and serve. So I encourage people to reach out and show your advocacy to your elected officials. Uh, often unindoctrinated with the people in our community are uh, mostly struggling so, so much um, when it comes to legal service access. Mm -hmm. We have very limited legal representations. I don't know if this should be also part of our early focus starting from it sounds it's, it, that, I think that's a perfect example. Um, so an elected official like me might not be the expert in knowing, right, where are the service staffs, like what is it that the community needs and so this is this is advocacy right here, right? Yeah. Hey, you know what? Legal services are something that we really need. So tell your elected official, and then these are things that we can push and ask for. I do know that we did approve increased funding um, for legal aid services for immigrants and refugees in our in our Chicago city budget because groups working with the immigrant and refugee community let Chicago City Council know that it was a need. And because of the crisis of people being sent here, right, without resources, we knew it was going to be something we needed. Now, we only increased it by, I think, $5 million, and it's not sufficient, but that's because the city of Chicago doesn't have as much money. Um, but yes, like, these are things that we also need support for. Thank you very much, um, Adam. This is so grateful. This is so important. We, we are so grateful to have you on this show. Um, what is the plan for this 2023? Um, well, first I'm going to win re-election. So, <laughs> that first, right? Yes. First I win re-election. Then I'm going to take maybe a week off. Okay. Maybe I take a break. Sleep uni, in. Uni, uni, you know, uni. No, no, maybe a short that. time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, but then it, it's just continuing. So it's been very exciting, um, uh, being new in office. Um, three years, three and a half years, four years can seem like a long time, but it's not. Um, so even though I know a lot about our community and started with a lot of experience, um, this first term has, even though I've passed a lot of significant legislation, I've done a lot of things in our community, but now I know even more, right? Like I know even more. And so I've got some great goals for, for the next four years. Um, so building on more of our housing advocacy, bringing in more of our community, continuing to opening my office up to make it more accessible. 
Um, we're working on some major housing developments in the neighborhood for more affordable housing for people and continue to get some more investments in our schools. So those have been some of the top priorities and I'm excited about being able to continue to build on that.